on World News Tonight. Victory Day. Russia celebrates the commemoration of the end of World War II as they ramp up attacks on Ukraine. ASEAN Summit. ASEAN foreign ministers arrived early in Indonesia prior to the head of state meeting. Gaza bombarded. Israel military kills major Hamas leaders in Gaza while civilians get caught in the crossfire. United by Music. Eurovision 2023 opens the axe walking Liverpool's Turquoise Carpet. This is Adaderna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers and you are watching World News and tonight we start off with breaking news. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has been arrested during a court appearance in capital Islamabad over corruption allegation. Musara Jamshad Shima, a leader of Khan's Pakistan Tehreek Insaf party, confirmed Khan's arrest. Dr. Akbar Nazir Khan, a top police official in Islamabad, stated that Khan was arrested in a case related to one Al Qadir Trust. The National Accountability had issued an arrest warrant for Khan on the 1st of May in relation to the case. Fawad Chaudhary of Khan's PTI party tweeted that the Islamabad High Court complex has been occupied by the Pakistani Rangers parliamentary and that by the Pakistani Rangers lawyers were being subjected to torture. Reports said Amar Farooq, the Chief Justice of the Islamabad High Court, has ordered government officials to appear before the court over Khan's arrest. Khan was removed from power in April last year after he lost a confidence vote in parliament. Since then, he has been campaigning for early national polls due in October this year. Security has been tightened all around Islamabad as there are fears of protests and riots arising from within Khan's supporters. As Russia celebrates what it calls its Victory Day today, multiple countries to its west are marking Europe Day, which celebrates peace and unity on the continent. French President Emmanuel Macron led the traditional ceremony on Paris's Champs-Élysées, commemorating the day that marked the end of World War II in Europe in 1945. Fearing protesters against the president's unpopular pension reform, turnout was kept low on the Champs-Élysées, where the president relit the flame on the tomb of an unknown soldier. And the few who attended were searched and closely supervised. His next engagement was at the prison in Lyon, where resistance leader Jean Moulin was once incarcerated. The president paid homage to the resistance spirit. Every time the French Republic is threatened, abandoned or betrayed, the French people stand up. The memory of those who passed through this prison lives on in these walls. Resistance fighters and free French men. This visit too, though, happened in closely controlled conditions. A wide security perimeter drawn to avoid protests. But the words of the president did nothing to assuage the anger of the 5,000 in the streets of Lyon, according to the CGT union. I'm here to show my complete opposition to the pension reform and because Macron's policy goes against what these people fought and died for. So the fact that he came here on this day to commemorate their death, it's a disgrace. Since the president bypassed parliament to increase the French retirement age despite widespread opposition, his public appearances have often been met by protesters banging pots and pans. Foreign ministers of Southeast Asian nations arrived on the Indonesian island of Lubuan, Bajo to discuss regional political and security issues, including the Myanmar crisis in the first of a series of meetings throughout the day. The discussions come ahead of the 42nd Association of Southeast Asian Nations Summit, which opens on Wednesday. Indonesia, Asians chair this year, is hosting the regional bloc's annual summit, where leaders are expected to push Myanmar to implement the peace consensus it agreed to two years ago to resolve the country's conflict. Indonesian President Widodo had condemned an attack in Myanmar on ASEAN officials delivery humanitarian aid and called for an end to violence in the strife-torn country. According to the Indonesian Foreign Ministry, eight meetings in plenary and retreatment formats are scheduled to be held, seven of which will be chaired by Indonesian President Joko Widodo. Leaders will meet and discuss global challenges and progress under the theme of ASEAN Matters, epicentrum of growth. 
Under the theme, leaders will focus on three main pillars. The purpose is to maintain ASEAN stability, peace and growth. The first and second pillars focus on the members group's centrality. This points to fostering economic growth and financial stability within the ASEAN nations. Russia has been ramping up its offensive against Ukraine leading up to Victory Day. Moscow, however, plans to scale down its Victory Day celebrations over fears that Ukraine may decide to hit Russian cities. Over the past few days, air raid alerts have been blaring throughout Ukraine. Even in the capital, Kyiv, explosions were heard in some parts of the city, with residents seen evacuating from affected areas. In the Black Sea coastal city of Odessa, many casualties were reported after Russia attacked the city using drones and cruise missiles. Military experts say Russia has been ramping up its offensives leading up to Victory Day on Tuesday in the hope of completing a full takeover of Bakhmut. And the same assessment is also being made by Ukraine, who fear losing control of Bakhmut is looming, with Wagner soldiers being used on the battlefield. As Moscow ramps up its airstrikes against Ukraine, Ukraine is now responding with a counterattack of its own in Russia-occupied Crimea. And while May 9th's Victory Day, which marks a Soviet victory over Nazi Germany in 1945, is usually celebrated in a grandiose manner, Russia is instead stepping up for airstrikes and tightening security measures in cities, where events will be held following a series of warnings of possible sabotage by Ukraine. It also comes at what some experts believe is a major turning point in the Russia-Ukraine war after 15 months of conflict. With no end to the war in sight, Ukraine may have to rely on China to mediate a peace deal with Russia, despite skepticism of China's role as a peacemaker. At least 13 Palestinians, including three commanders of the militant group Islamic Jihad, have been killed in Israeli airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. A Palestinian health official said that six women and four children were amongst the dead. Israel said that it had launched an operation targeting militants who posed an imminent threat to its citizens. Israel killed three senior Islamic Jihad commanders in airstrikes on Gaza on Tuesday, as well as several civilians, including children. That's according to Palestinian officials, coming as the Israeli military confirmed it launched the operation targeting the Islamic Jihad leadership. The armed group is the second most powerful in the Hamas-ruled, blockaded coastal enclave. Powerful explosions rocked the area for hours as witnesses reported Israeli jets hitting Islamic Jihad shelters in residential areas and sites across the Gaza Strip, including training camps and border posts. Videos showed billowing smoke and flames that lit up the night sky as trucks of firefighters rushed to a building that had been hit. Israel's defense minister said the military was working with a Shin Bet intelligence service to launch the, quote, precise operation in Gaza, adding any terrorist who harms Israeli citizens will be made to regret it. Islamic Jihad's armed wing confirmed the three commanders' deaths. A spokesman said, quote, this crime will not pass unpunished. The airstrikes are the latest incident in more than a year of surging violence, with repeated Israeli military raids and escalating settler violence in the occupied West Bank, amid a spate of Palestinian street attacks targeting Israelis. A unit of Israel's defense ministry that coordinates civilian affairs with the Palestinians said its two Gaza crossings were closed to people and goods until further notice. Expecting rocket fire in response to the strikes, Israel's military urged citizens living in towns within 25 miles of Gaza to stay near bomb shelters until Thursday evening. Dead bodies were still being recovered from two villages in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo where floods killed more than 400 people last week in one of the country's deadliest disasters in recent history. Residents in the village of Pushushu make their way through what was a vibrant market just a few days ago. Heavy rain overflowed the neighboring river last Thursday, washing away everything in their path in a matter of hours. This woman had relocated here with her family in January from a neighboring province, fleeing the fighting between the Congolese army and the M23 rebels. She lost her two children, her two sisters and her parents in the floods. I no longer have a family and I no longer have fields. 
Now I have to find a place to sleep. I know that my husband is alive, but the children are dead. Hundreds of bodies have been recovered, but many remain missing. And survivors are struggling to get hands on basic essential goods. We think that many bodies washed up in the lake. They'll be visible after three days. And we wonder how we'll get through this. We don't have body bags. And we don't have enough funding for what we do. The disaster in the Democratic Republic of Congo comes after neighbouring Rwanda and Uganda were also recently ravaged by floods. Climate researchers say global warming is the culprit behind the torrential rainfall in Africa and highly vulnerable communities on the continent, which contribute the least to global heating, is bearing the brunt. Going into short commercial break, more news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, light showers offered a brief respite to scorching wildfires in Alberta, Canada, but officials said that they are not out of the woods yet, as the province expects to warm up towards the weekend. Cooler weather on Monday brought some relief to firefighters battling widespread wildfires in Western Canada, but officials warned it could be months before they're brought under control. A state of emergency was declared in Alberta on Saturday, with more than 700 firefighters deployed. Christy Tucker is the Alberta Wildfire Information Manager. Well, we're not out of the woods yet. We're expecting to warm up towards the weekend, which could raise fire danger levels again, and we anticipate the wind direction could shift, which will change how we tackle these fires. There are nearly 100 active wildfires burning in Alberta, and around a third of them are considered out of control. More than 29,000 people have been evacuated from their homes so far. Nearly 300 patients in long-term care facilities have also been moved to safety. Alberta's Premier, Danielle Smith, on Monday announced that the government will be providing one-time emergency financial aid to residents displaced by the blazes. Every adult who's been evacuated and displaced for seven consecutive days will receive $1,250, along with an additional $500 for each dependent child under age 18. These payments will help evacuees pay for accommodations, food and other basic necessities. The unprecedented wildfire season has shut in at least 3% of Canada's energy production. The country is the world's fourth largest crude producer and about 80% of its oil comes from Alberta. The fires have primarily affected light oil and natural gas producers who shut in operations as a precaution. Just as the World Health Organization announced COVID-19 is not a health emergency, most nations are lifting travel restrictions and easing COVID rules. South Korea is one of those nations as discussions are underway on the possible lifting of the mandatory self-quarantine for those infected with COVID-19. Following the World Health Organization's declaration that COVID-19 is no longer a global health emergency, health authorities in South Korea are discussing further relaxing the country's virus rules. The remaining mandates are the seven-day quarantine for those who test positive for the virus and mask wearing at high-risk facilities like hospitals and pharmacies. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said back in March that the scrapping of virus protocols would happen in three stages. One, lowering COVID-19's national crisis level from the highest serious to the second highest alert. Under this measure, the self-isolation period will be shortened from seven to five days and inbound travelers to South Korea will no longer be advised to take a PCR test within three days of arrival. Two, downgrading COVID-19 to a level four infectious disease, the lowest in the country's four-tier system from level two. With this, mask wearing will no longer be a requirement regardless of location, while self-isolation will also no longer be required, with both just advised. Three, treating COVID-19 as an endemic disease. Mask wearing and quarantine are not even advised. As of now, the implementation of stage one is highly likely. The KDCA has been repeatedly saying stage one would be implemented once the WHO declares an end to COVID-19 status as a public health emergency of international concern. 
But another possible scenario is jumping straight to stage two. South Korea's National Advisory Committee on Infectious Diseases held a meeting on Monday to discuss the easing of COVID-19 protocols. At the meeting, most experts agreed on integrating steps one and two, scrapping mandatory quarantine, considering the stable virus situation both at home and abroad. And the KDCA will hold an emergency assessment meeting on Tuesday afternoon with the same agenda. Based on the outcomes of the two meetings, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters will make the final call. The decision will be made either this week or next, as Prime Minister Han Dok-su, who convenes the meetings of the body, won't return from a trip to Europe until this Thursday. President Joe Biden and top Republicans and Democrats from Congress are set to sit down this week to try to resolve a three-month standoff over the $31.4 trillion U.S. debt saving to avoid the crippling default before the end of May. A White House sit-down between President Joe Biden and the Republican and Democratic congressional leaders set for Tuesday aims to put an end to the U.S. debt ceiling standoff and avoid an economic disaster. The Democratic president is calling on lawmakers to raise the federal government's self-imposed $31.4 trillion borrowing limit without conditions and avoid a crippling default before the end of May. We're not a deadbeat nation. We pay our bills. Biden last week criticized House Republicans for threatening not to raise the debt limit unless Democrats agree to steep cuts in the upcoming budget. I'm going to uh, reiterate to congressional leaders that they should do what every other Congress has done, that is, pass the debt limit, avoid default. And as I've said all along, we can debate where to cut, how much to spend, how to finally move the tax system where everybody begins to pay their fair share or continue the route they're on, but, under, but not under the threat of default. But Republican House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said his chamber won't approve any deal that does not cut spending to address a growing budget deficit. Tuesday's meeting marks the first time Biden and McCarthy have met since February. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell and top House Democrat Hakeem Jeffries will also join the talks. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre on Monday refused to call the scheduled discussion a negotiation. We should not have House Republicans manufacturing a crisis on something that has been done 78 times since 1960. This is their constitutional duty. Congress must act. That's what the president's going to make very clear uh, with, uh, with the leaders tomorrow. Uh, Congress must avoid default without conditions, without conditions, as they did three times before in the last administration. Analysts do not expect an immediate deal to avert what would be a historic default, which the Treasury Department has warned could come as soon as June 1st. Forecasters warn a default would likely send the U.S. economy into a deep recession with soaring unemployment. A lawyer for former United States President Donald Trump has called a rape and defamation case brought by the writer E. Jean Carroll an affront to the justice system. During closing arguments in a civil trial in Manhattan Federal Court, lawyer Joseph Takapina urged jurors to set aside any opinions they might have bought about Trump and reject what he called Carroll's efforts to profit from a false story. Closing arguments were heard for Donald Trump's civil rape trial, where former Elle magazine advice columnist E. Jean Carroll accused the ex-U.S. president of rape and defamation. A lawyer for Carroll argued on Monday that Trump's absence from the trial shows that, quote, he did it. Lawyer Mike Ferrero told jurors, quote, he never looked you in the eye and denied raping Miss Carroll, adding, quote, you should draw the conclusion that that's because he did it. 79-year-old Carol sued 76-year-old Trump, alleging he raped her in a Manhattan department store in 1995 or 1996, and then defamed her by denying it happened in an October 2022 post on Trump's Truth Social platform. In that post, he called her claims a complete con job and a hoax and a lie. Trump waived his right to testify at trial and opted not to present a defense, gambling that jurors will find that Carol failed to make a persuasive case. 
In his closing argument Monday, Trump's lawyer Joe Tacopina said Carroll's inability to recall the date of the alleged incident made it impossible for Trump to defend himself by citing an alibi and called the case an affront to justice. This is an absolutely outrageous case, Tacopina said. Two of Carol's longtime friends had testified that she told them about the attack shortly after it occurred and said they believed her. Carol, who was seen leaving the New York court, is seeking unspecified monetary damages. Her lawyer told jurors the lawsuit is not about the money but about Carol getting her name back. The six-man, three-woman jury is expected to begin deliberating on Tuesday. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Residents in New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, saw flash flooding and landslides today following heavy rains and thunderstorms that struck the country's North Island. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen arrived in Kyiv for talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Von der Leyen was met at a station by Ukrainian Deputy Foreign Minister Yevhen Perbienis. China expelled a Canadian diplomat in Shanghai in a tit-for-tat row after Ottawa told a Toronto-based Chinese diplomat to leave the country. Escalating already tense bilateral relations amid concerns about China influencing in Canada. German industry produced 3.4% less in March than in the previous month, after output had risen for two months in a row at the start of 2023. The decline affected most industries of Europe's largest economy. Production in the country's important automotive sector dropped 6.5%. A luxury watch store located in the main street of Tokyo's Poshginsa district was robbed by several men. The men barged in the store, threatening shopkeepers with a knife, then broke showcases to steal watches on display. Iran's foreign minister spokesperson said that the reopening process of the Iranian diplomatic missions in Saudi Arabia is in its final stage. Making the remarks at a weekly press conference in Tehran, Nazar Khanani said that the progress has been made in preparing for the resumption of Iranian diplomatic missions operations in Saudi Arabia. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. And we, we leave you tonight with Eurovision 2023, kicking off as 37 contenders walk the turquoise carpet in Liverpool. Stay safe and have a good night.